Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Data Diversity. We'd like to thank you for joining this Data Diversity webinar, Data Quality for Non-Data People. And as you can see, WebEx has undergone a significant UI update, so feel free to look around. You will find most of the needed icon buttons at the bottom middle of your screen. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, or if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and additional information requested throughout. Now let me introduce to you our speaker for today, Kasu Sista. Kasu has more than 35 years of experience in information technology, strategic solution alignment, and project program management. He has spent a significant amount of time working with data assets and has spent four years as the CIO of Health Information Technology Company where he led the effort focused on acquiring, cleaning, blending, securing, and distributing healthcare data for the purposes of population health management and patient engagement. Prior to that, Kasu has worked on various aspects of data, such as governance, metadata, data quality, BI, and analytics. Kasu is uniquely qualified to deliver on the version of using data for better outcomes based on a 35-plus year career spanning many industries and technologies. And with that, let me turn it over to Kasu to get the, today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Thank you, Shannon, and thank you, everybody, for uh, taking the time to attend and, uh, and for Data University hosting it. I'm trying to flip this slide. There we go. So today we'll be talking about uh, quality, um, quality from the point of view of both data practitioners and the quote unquote business people. So we'll be talking about who they are and what, what is quality, what's perceived quality, um, data lifespan, metadata and KPIs, core metrics, what do you measure, impact of data quality, and some takeaways. So I promise I'm not going to read the slides uh, going forward. <clears throat> so as uh, Shannon has gracefully um, introduce me. Uh, my name is Kasu Sista. I work with a company called The Wisdom Chain, uh, a consulting firm based out of Chicago. And uh, we focus on um, mainly on data analytics, data governance, and data quality. So I want to start off with setting the context for the conversation that we're having today, which is who are the data people and who are not. So with that, I'm going to very broadly define uh, who the data people are and who they are not. So I say data people are anyone that has the, the words data analyst report in their titles or identifies with them. So I'm sure there is hundreds of titles out there that directly involve data, but this is just for the conversation that we're having today. This is uh, what I'm going to define that as. So, and business people are anyone that does not identify with the previous slide. So, this slide pretty much sums up what I'm going to talk about today. So, uh, when we, when a, when a business person is talking to a, uh, a, a data person, uh, they're entirely two different perspectives. So, if you look at the slide, it shows the guy on the right is the one who filled up the blackboard to and he's very excited about his work. He wants to show the work, and he wants people to appreciate the difficulty of getting at the answer, right? Uh, whereas on the person on the left-hand side is going, just tell me yes or no. I don't really need to know I trust you, right? And so this is a conversation we have many times, you know, through our career and through, through our days. Uh, at, being on both sides of the equation, you know, I have run businesses and I've been pra practicing data person for the last 35 years. This is a very difficult conversation to have. So with that, I want to start, uh, start with defining what is quality. Right? So I'm going to show you a couple of pictures. And uh, since I cannot interact with you guys face to face, I'm going to answer, answer them myself and hopefully you agree with them. 
And so I'm looking at these two cars here, and somebody says, okay, which one is more, you know, higher quality? And immediately what comes to my mind is a Mercedes, right? Because uh, the bottom one is a Chevy, top one is a Mercedes, and we never ask ourselves why. And now we have a Toyota and a, um, a Chevy. Again, what comes to immediately to my mind is, you no, know, Toyota is higher quality. I know a little bit about Toyota's uh, manufacturing processes, you know, their TPS, Toyota um, uh, production system, which is based on, you know, hypothesis and experiment. And so it's basically a continuous improvement type of a uh, methodology that they use. And, but even if I didn't know all that, I would still say Toyota is of higher quality. Then the next slide is, you know, I have two comparable cars. I have a BMW and a um, Mercedes. And now, now how do I know which is of higher quality? At this point, I don't know because I think both are comparable quality. And now things like intangibles come into play. We start looking at other things to evaluate quality. So one of the things I want to start is start looking at what those before I go there, sorry, I, this is one of the things I want to establish early in the um, the conversation is uh, this equation. So immediately, you know, quality means trust. It's like you trust and then you buy. So essentially there's a relationship between that's directly proportional um, between trust and um, quality. So. Now we let's take a look at what the quality dimensions are, right? And what is perceived quality? Because quality is not an absolute thing. It, it depends on who is looking at it and uh, who is um, making the decision. So these are the dimensions that um, a survey that the European Journal of Business Management did a while ago, um, in, back in 2013, uh, surveyed uh, mobile phone owners. So these are basically what they distill as the dimensions of perceived quality in a product. And so as a, although it's for mobile phones, I'm sure it applies just as well to other types of products as well. So reliability is number one, durability is number two, ease of maintenance is third, ease of use, then brand name and price. So surprisingly, brand name and price are at the bottom. And, uh, you know, I know most of us, if something is expensive, we have a tendency to directly equate it to um, uh, quality, but it's not necessarily always true. So what's interesting is the reliability and durability are two things that you can only establish over time, right? These are not something that's immediately apparent to you when you're trying to make a decision. So, so can we come to how do we evaluate? How do we decide something is of higher quality versus another? How do you compare um, before you decide something is of higher quality? So we use our five senses, right? You see, you hear, you smell, you touch, and you taste. And depending on what the product is, obviously you're not gonna taste a, um, you know, an automobile, you'll taste you know, fruit. So um, really we use our senses to make um, tangible evaluation of something. Right? Next <clears throat> level is we go talk to, um, walk into the store, look at the product, you know, talk to a real estate agent or automobile dealer, or we ask our friends, family and friends, if they have any experience with the product and we do our research, you know, we go through um, magazines if I'm looking for a car, road and track, motor trend, or, I'll, you know, there's so much information on the web now, it's almost impossible to know what's true, what's true. So I have a tendency to believe more of printed uh, material if I'm doing some research. And, and then lastly, we look at the company marketing, you know, the glossy brochures you get, or the marketing material. Right. So after all this, we make a determination 
And notice at this point, I'm not even talking about personal experience. So we, may, we do all those things and we buy something, but we still really don't trust it. Okay? So we, first time you buy a, a car, you do all your research, but not until a few years later you go, I really like this car. You know, it has met all, all the check boxes that I need. So trust has to be earned and should come only after the passage of time. So Arthur Ashe said that, and that's true, right? So you, you only trust people, products, brands after your own personal experience with it, okay? So that is when we're buying products. So think of, think of us playing the role of the consumer, and that's what we do. So now we come to data and I say, okay, so this is how in real life we're used to evaluating things using our senses, using all these other dimensions that we have to say, I like this product. And then you have, you develop a uh, personal experience with that product and you trust it. Now, when I come to data, all those things are thrown away. I have an entirely different set of criteria to judge if data is of good quality or not. And so this is a very large gap in the two sides of us and the two sides of the people that we're talking about uh, today. So the quality dimensions are validity, accuracy, consistency, completeness, uniqueness, timeliness, fit for purpose, and source. So I want to go through this um, quickly one by one. Sorry. Okay, be valid. So if data is to be trusted, right, it has to deal with all these dimensions that I just mentioned. So if I am data, what do I need to earn my trust? So I have to be valid. So validity could be measured because typically uh, we have a reference set for us to bounce against. So that's something that can be measured. I think I, did I skip a slide? Excuse me one second. I think, oh, sorry. So I skipped a slide. So how can data earn its trust? So we have all these um, dimensions. We say be valid be accurate, be complete, be consistent, be unique and timely. And then are these things measurable is the question. So this is my, um, my experience with what can be measured and what, what is kind of hazy is uh, validity can be measured because typically we have a reference set. Accuracy is hard to measure. Completeness is situation dependent. Sometimes you can measure, sometimes you can't. And um, consistency, some, again, is um, depends on the situation. Uniqueness can be measured and the timeliness can be measured. So now let's go look at them one at a time. So I have validity means that I have actual, my values that I see in my data actually are consistent with the defined values for that field. For example, ICD-10 codes. Uh, they're published and they're, you know, by the federal government and uh, that those are the codes used by everybody. So uh, if I get an ICD-10 code in the record that I'm um, checking and if it doesn't match one of the ICD-10 codes that's in the reference data, then it'll be invalid. And so I, otherwise, I would say it's valid. So it, it's something that we can talk about and calculate some metrics on. Accuracy on the other hand is harder. For example, you know, I cannot be accurate about lifespan, right? Because it's an estimate. And so there are things that um, we use in business that are not necessarily measurable from an accuracy point of view. So every insurance company have their own lifespan calculation. Uh, and so, and which one is more accurate than the other? You know, we don't know because those 
happen to be statistical um, numbers, which are essentially an expected value, a probability of something happening. So accuracy is harder to measure. And it has to be complete. So this is, uh, sometimes it's, we can do that. For example, you're applying for a loan at a bank. Um, they would not process it um, if all the, if not all the fields are filled and all the signatures are there. Um, accuracy is another issue. So here's the interesting thing. You know, just because something is complete doesn't mean uh, it's accurate because people fill out fake applications every day and the data is not accurate. It really doesn't match the person that's filling it, but they do it anyway. And that's a huge business. So anyway, so it's completeness doesn't imply accuracy. Uh, consistent. So make sure data meets expected constraints over a period of time. So I, this is basically saying that things uh, happen the same way. So I'm getting, you know, about 100,000 transactions a day. So if something goes out of whack, I get 150,000 one day, I know something is wrong. So consistency can be used as a constraint. Uh, measuring of a constraint and also can be used to set constraints, new constraints. And be unique, and this can be measured. Um, you know, we, this is something that our data, data practices depend on is uh, unique values to identify things, to making sure that there is no um, mishandling uh, of services type of things based on the ID. So this is a something that we deal with and may not, may not be able to achieve it, but we know we can deal with it. Um, and timeliness, timeliness absolutely can be measured and sometimes we depend on it. For example, stock prices, they have to be up to, you know, at the tick level, each transaction gets uh, transmitted. So um, otherwise, you know, people trading are not gonna be very happy. So these are some of the metrics that we're looking at for each of the dimensions. Validity, it's, um, again, you have to define a threshold. You know, if it's 100%, it's 100%, that means it has to be absolutely valid every single time. Or you can say, hey, 90% is fine, and then um, you know, we can make that business rule and make that happen. And similarly, accuracy is a, a threshold that's acceptable. Complete net is again acceptable threshold. Um, consistency is either a number or some kind of a probability. Uniqueness can be measured, no duplicates. And timeliness is a ratio in saying, you know, how, how timely am I? Am I current 99% of the time, 100% of the time? So that's a measure to, for timeliness. So these are the um, dimensions and measures that we currently have in our toolbox as data practitioners. And this is something that cannot be done just by data practitioner alone. And this is where uh, data and business have to collaborate to set this threshold for the data. So as uh, somebody that built and uh, ran a data analytics platform, I can tell you this is extremely, extremely important to be able to say well, what's acceptable. Um, because we were processing medical claims, um, Medicaid medical claims and uh, pharmaceutical claims along with some other data. And um, some of the data had to be 100% accurate, otherwise we won't pass it. So anytime uh, something was had to pertain to a patient, we had to be 100% accurate because we, we could not uh, make any mistakes in terms of a patient's healthcare data. So we had to be extremely diligent, stringent, track the lineage, I'll talk about that a little later, um, to make sure that we have control of those data elements and they're correct. And some others, you know, we never really cared about the payment amount because our warehouse was more supporting care management and the population management. So we we're not part of the revenue cycle. So we didn't really care that much about um, the dollars, I mean, if they're in the ballpark, they're reasonable, you know, we're fine. Right? We're not gonna spend a lot of time trying to make them accurate. 
So the, making sure that these, and then we had to work with our customer to understand what's important and what's not, what's not so important. And so it's really a collaborative effort for, for uh, data quality metrics to work. It has to be a collaborative effort between the people that are being benefited by the data that you're cleaning and, um, you know, processing and distributing. Um, and the people that are actually consuming that data. It has to be a collaboration. Okay, meaning, uh, moving on. So basically, it takes two to do the trust tango, right? Uh, the one who risks, the trustor, and the, in this case, it'll be the business person. And the one who is trustworthy, uh, the data practitioner. And each must play their role, but they have to work together. So I want to talk about the points of view. So we have um, the uh, business person, you know, who's um, business oriented. And then typically this is what I always uh, felt like when I first walked into an organization. It's like, who does what? Who, who has what data? Who is in charge of what? You know, basically it's a very confusing thing to walk into a new data shop. I don't know how many of you have done that and try to make sense of what's going on because if we have 10,000 data shops, we have 10,000 data shops. There, there's not too many similarities in how things are um, managed and uh, run in those, uh, in each of, each of the shops. So, so the point of view of a business person is more from the point, so he's, he's thinking what's the most viable product I can build and who is my customer, and where do I find good people, how do I pay for it, and how do I use technology. So if a really, you know, committed business person is not really worrying so much about the technology, and he's, his point of view is, uh, or her point of view is, how do I use technology to do all the other things that I need to do that are in the, in the slide here. So as a data practitioner, uh, if I put my other head on, my first question was always, why do they need this? Don't we already have that? They have this, they have that. So, so our immediate reaction is, why? Why do we need to do this? And the, the second thing I go is, okay, well, do I have all the data? Where do I get the data from? So that's the question I ask. And then I go, okay, now I need to process it. Who can tell me what the business rules are? So this is where we're scrambling around and saying, who knows, what do I do with this, right? And uh, many times there's nobody. You probably know more than anybody on the business side what to do with it. So the, all these uh, cases uh, you, we have to handle. And then do I have to modify the data model? So that's always a biggie, right? Uh, if you, especially if you're a warehouse and you may have modified the data model, then there's maybe uh, many, many issues that you have to deal with. For example, uh, you know, I, I keep five years worth of online data online and I add a column to my um, fact table. How do I backfill it, right? Is, do I have the um, data available? How do I explain to the business person that we only have data going forward? Just because we added a column didn't mean the five years worth of data magically appear um, in that warehouse, so immediately all the reports, they'll be able to go use that um, column, right? And I had many, many conversations and many arguments about this, about how do I, it's easy enough to add columns to dimensions, as we know, um, but harder to add columns to a fact table, and because you have to gap fill that thing. And recalculate any of the metrics based on uh, columns because this column might actually impact other columns. So there's issues that we deal with on a daily basis. Adding a column to a fact table is not that simple, but we're always having kind of these conversations with the business people. And so the idea is we have to educate uh, in simple terms why it's difficult to add a column to a fact table, right? And so, so I, that's a hard thing to do because most of most data and technology people are not, um, you know, uh, known to be great communicators, right? 
So especially in, you know, when they have to explain difficult, uh, difficult concepts to somebody that's, a, that's not um, a layperson, if you will. So this is, this is the mindset we have. So we're thinking you know, uh, on the ground level and the business person is thinking at maybe 50,000 foot level. So going back to the, you know, this little matrix that um, you know, Donald Rumsfeld has uh, talked about way back. Um, so there's known knowns, known unknowns, unknown knowns, and unknown unknowns. And where are data people most comfortable? They're most comfortable in the top left quadrant because they know it. They know the data, they know where it goes, they know what to do with it. And that's the place we're most comfortable with. Um, and then uh, known unknowns, we're okay with it because we know we don't know it, but you know, at least we can explain to people we don't have that data, right? Unknown knowns, on the other hand, and unknown unknowns, the data, pe data people couldn't care less. If I don't know it, I don't care. Um, so, you know, we try to future-proof data models. We try to future, it, you know, never worked for me, for me to add extra columns to a table because some something might appear there some, sometime, right? So it's not worthwhile uh, keeping, you know, things for future when you're a data person. Data, data happens now, and if it doesn't happen, I know why it doesn't happen. Whereas the business people are dealing in all four quadrants and they're dealing with uh, unknowns and that is the uncertainty. And so the business people, as a business person, you have to deal with a lot of uncertainty on your daily life. Whereas if you're a data person, um, you're not dealing with uncertainty. Basically, you like knowing things and that's, you know, and so that's the gap between the two points of view. So I'm going to go back to my equation I created before, quality equals trust. Now I say trust is inversely proportional to uncertainty, right? And so what does that mean? The more, more uncertainty I have, the less trust I have. And this goes for both people and products and data. So this, this is a universal uh, formula because I don't know, you know, we are afraid of strangers, um, I don't know this person who is writing a report for me, so I'm not so sure that the report is going to come out correctly. Right? Um, this data, I don't have a way to check this data. I don't have a third party um, benchmark to be able to test this data. Uh, so I don't know, so I don't trust it. Right? So it's really uncertainty uh, creates mistrust. So now where do we meet? So if you look at, you know, what happens when the, we, um, you know, why, what, and how, and say, where do we play? So the business people typically play in the why space. You know, they are the ones trying to figure out what product to build, uh, what report they need to make a decision. So they are the ones dealing in the why space. And then, the what space is where we collaborate. This is, we're deciding what to be built. You know, and the famous words of Steve Jobs, customer doesn't know what he wants. And that may not always be true, um, but lots of times customers don't know what they want when they, but they know, they always know why they want it, right? And so this is where, and the data, as data practitioners, we know how to use that data to produce whatever product is required. So. We have to, the business person has to articulate the why. So this is the conversation that has to happen. The why needs to be articulated with the business person and the collaboration has to happen between the business and the data practitioners and the how should be left to the data practitioner. So any overlap in these um, circles, uh, the ellipsis creates conflict, right? For example, if the business person starts telling um, the data practitioners how, 
that creates friction. So the topics of conversation between business and uh, data should involve these six things. It's from um, uh, Tom Davenport's uh, article back in uh, HBR in 2013, and saying it has to be important that both people, both sides understand the business problem uh, clearly. And then you have, to, you have to decide as you're solving the problem, if the problem is solved, how do you measure the impact on the business of solving that problem? What data is available? And so it's important that both know that just because you want something or you need something, um, you cannot always have it because we may not have the data available. That means we may have to go collect the data, we may have to uh, go to a third party, we may have to impute the data. So many, many ways that you can get the data possibly, but it's not going to be uh, as simple as writing a report. Okay. So you need to, we need to know what data is available. And then have an initial hypothesis and saying, okay, what's the, what's the first version of something that we want and the solution for that hypothesis. And then um, finally, a, a way to, like we said in the second bullet, business impact of the solution. So once it's um, solved, what is the uh, impact on the business? So um, it's really, Knowing all those things and say that's the conversation to have around and both from both sides, uh, those are the topics that you'd have a conversation around. So now we talked about data quality and how the two, two ways people perceive quality. And then we talked about how do we have a conversation with the data people. Now I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about data itself and the data lifespan. So for me, data quality is a three-legged stool. So we have metadata and meta data governance, and then we have metrics. And this is, a, so we always need those six things or eight dimensions. You know, I've seen many different ways of parsing the data quality dimensions. Those metrics are extremely important. And so those things actually allow us to uh, understand data quality and allow us to get to a quality of data that uh, we want at a threshold level. And then metadata helps us get data because metadata is what, um, you know, what tells us about the data and governs all the policies and procedures that tells you uh, how to, you know, governance uses metadata to, to put constraints and to monitor and track the data and then metrics allow us to evaluate how well we're doing and then put processes in place to be able to continuously do better, right? So these are, these are the three legs of the stool which gives us their quality, right? Now this is a, um, a diagram which looks very similar to any uh, warehouse uh, BI type of diagram because that's how data also flows. So if I look at this diagram, on the left-hand side are all the enterprise entities. And so the entities actually run business processes. At any, any point, there might be hundreds of business processes in a, even in a small company. And every time you execute a business process, and then you use some tools, such as applications, you collect data, and that data got, gets collected and stored. And so that's how data gets created. Um, so, um, and then that data is um, used for other purposes than what, it, what the transactional data was intended for. And we have, um, you know, ETL and data preparation tools take that data from where it's originally stored and um, move it into different uh, constructs like data lakes, data warehouses, uh, relational databases, could be in-memory databases, and um, NoSQL databases. So the, there could be many, many instances of these things. And then finally, we use that data that we collected and curated, and then um, create products out of that, such as reports, visualizations, and other type of products, extracts and uh, people consume it. So the, and then eventually data gets stale and gets disposed. 
So if you notice, this through the whole process, we have metadata management and data governance at the at the bottom, because those are the ones that really help us ensure quality as data moves through the life of being created, transformed, used, and then disposed of. Um, so metadata is really data about data. I'm not going to go into great lengths with uh, what it is. There is such thing as uh, technical metadata and uh, business metadata. And data governance so applies both during data creation and the left side of that slide that I went through in the lifespan of data. And then um, it's also passive govern governance is uh, used in the data consumption. On the left side is what we call active governance. As in the process of data creation, we are much more um, active in terms of doing governance, or we should be. Um, whereas on the data consumption side, it's more passive in the sense we are, we are more controlling who sees what data and uh, what type of um, you know, <clears throat> capabilities they have type of things. It's more a uh, passive type of data governance that is on the consumption side, whereas the active data governance resides on the creation side. So with that, I want to start, talk a little bit about core metrics. Core metrics from the organization point of view. So far we talked about uh, metrics that measure data quality. And now I want to talk a little bit about um, metrics that uh, a corporation would use, um, uses for which they need quality data. Right? And so this is this picture up front is a balanced scorecard. It's, um, something uh, uh, Kaplan has come up with way back when, and it's still very relevant back in the 90s, and it's still pretty relevant to every organization. So um, how do we decide between value and base? So we collected a lot of data, right? And it's almost like um, most data shops are not like um, my basement. Um, there's a lot of stuff in there, but I'm not sure which one of it I would use again. So how do we know what, what's going to be useful to us and what's not? Because valuable data helps us make better decisions. It helps us attract uh, more customers because we can you know, do, for example, uh, what Netflix does, you know, customize your viewing experience based on your preferences and your buying patterns and things like that. So, by doing that type of a analytics and we are uh, we can attract more customers providing that type of an experience and then um, you know basically we we can make more money if we are actually monetizing if we have good data we can monetize it to make money so how do we know something is good or bad so we what we do is we have to define our kpis and this could be at, corp, at enterprise level, it could be departmental level. And if we have data that doesn't really go into creating our KPIs, uh, I'm making a very broad statement, but that's, I think it's true, is by defining KPIs, um, you'll understand what data is valuable and which data is not valuable. Uh, if it doesn't go into any of the KPIs that uh, require for your company to run, then that data has no value for you, okay? And so, have a, um, a way to design, decide how to create and maintain them, which is data governance. Determine what data is needed to create them, metadata. Data is created, taken care of, used and disposed of, data lifespan, and any data that's not used for, purpose, for a purpose is waste. So it's really we're using uh, data governance, metadata, and metrics to also help us determine which data is valuable and which data is not. So and create a process that helps you choose metrics. So metrics should not be um, chosen randomly, I mean, we all know that, I'm sure everybody's experienced in the audience. So, but uh, we need a, you need a standard process 
that allows you to create metrics. So how do you work backwards from what's required by the business? For example, business wants to increase sales. What are the levers required? What are the measures required? And, and then what are the metrics that allow me to monitor that? So that's, it's really about uh, having a process that creates metrics that actually has an impact on the business. It can be very simple, but very effective. So let me show you a couple of examples. Uh, Uber and Airbnb have very similar metrics that they measure. One is liquidity. It says, are there enough vehicles on the, um, on the road at any time? And how good are we at matching customers with uh, the cars? And how much do the customers trust us? And that's the ratings that you give. They aggregate them, then they use that as a measure to say, what's the trust level of customers in a particular area? And Zappos is another one. They, they have a single form that's filled out and they call it the happiness experience. And so there's a, a bunch of things, how long, how long were you on the phone with the customer? Did you find out anything personal about the customer? So these are the type of things that they measure from the uh, call center operators. And, uh, and then they create a happiness experience to tell them how happy the customer is with them. So that is one of the you know, core metrics for Zappos. Uh, Netflix, on the other hand, has, a, has one that they call uh, efficient content, and what that means is really how much happiness are you gener generating, and I don't know how they do that, but for dollar spent. Okay. So if the customer spent ten dollars, how much ha how happy is he with the dollar spent? So and then the idea is to increase that happiness for that customer, and so uh, these are the type of core metrics that you need and. Now, to measure that, Netflix has to go through a lot of analysis, and they have to decide what data is needed, and then ensure that data is of high quality before they really understand uh, how happy the customer is. Okay? So it's always, uh, I always let, help me to understand what data I need and why this thing is happening by starting with the um, metric, and then working backwards to see what data is required for that. So have a process to do that, and they'll give you uh, a leg up on defining metrics. So good metrics are comparable, so you can compare them against other um, organizations, other uh, people. You can compare them against yourself in a different time frame, and then they're understandable. They're easy to know, so everybody understands, for example, happiness uh, experience. Uh, so it's anybody knows what that means as soon as they hear it, right? And they're usually ratios, right? Because most of them, um, numbers by themselves are not worth a whole lot. Um, you know, sometimes they may be, but usually ratios are the most useful uh, metrics. So and too many metrics is the same as no metrics because it doesn't help you a whole lot. So if you look at where, where Google, Google searches used to be to where they are now, now there's so many ads in my first page, I have to seriously search for a real link that doesn't say ad on it. So too many metrics, too many results, too much information is, is no information because it doesn't give you any, um, any value. So what is the impact of that quality? So we have talked about how you know, quality is quite, we have to measure the dimension, we can improve the data, the conversation business and data, and we looked at the uh, data uh, lifespan and say where data gets created, um, processed and consumed. So now we talk about what is the impact of quality in, on those things. So poor data quality creates lack of trust and confidence, potentially missed opportunities, lost revenues, and reputational damage. So 
the lack of trust is something that's very easy to um, lose. I mean, lack of trust is um, hard to, let me see, let me have, trust is easy to lose. Um, one mistake, and this happened to me once because we have, we're producing a report and we're calculating a value that told them how many, how many emergency room visits the patient did uh, in the last 90 days. So um, we had the data, we had the data from the admits and discharges and we had the data from claims. And what we didn't do is um, we didn't take into account that some of the, um, some of the information we got for admits in the claims was already uh, covered in the admit dis uh, discharge transmit messages we received. So we counted both of them and we came up with a very large number, and uh, which is obviously a mistake because we had to dedupe uh, the reconcile the two records and saying if I got the same information in an ADT message and I got information in a claim, it's the same patient, same time, so counted as one, not as two. So that dedoping from that point on, it took us about I don't know three to four months to convince our customer that we fixed that problem, that um, uh, that the data is now good, right? So it's very easy to make a mistake um, with the not knowing the data fully, and it's very hard to gain the trust back because that mistake has caused uh, lack of confidence. So, um, and on the other, on the flip side, good data quality gives you confidence. You know, you can make your decision confidently because you know that the metrics you got are correct and increase productivity because it helps you to see where the waste is and where the um, deficiencies are and you can fix them and you can increase productivity, increase agility, um, and definitely better customer satisfaction. We have seen over the last 10 years, um, you know, customer service has improved across the board I know, I know, you know, there's a lot of places that it doesn't feel like it, but in general, the, your vendors know you much better than they used to. And uh, that also you know, led to better marketing because we know the, who the customer is, we can segment them very nicely and uh, do a lot of target marketing, and um, which is gonna help us more sales and more profits. So it's really, uh, the impact of business quality and business processes is very direct and directly attributable. So we almost come to the end. Uh, I have a few takeaways for you guys. Understand the different points of view, and that's you know. So it has to be a, uh, a two-way street. You know, data people um, deal in knowns and business people in dealing uncertainties, and uncertainty creates mistrust. So knowing this, I think uh, we can work towards uh, having better conversations and that lead to more trust, which would lead to better data quality. How do we evaluate quality? Product quality is tangible, and we use tangible and intangible dimensions. Whereas for data quality, we use quantitative and qualitative dimensions. Uh, so that is, a, that is the gap in terms of how we evaluate, how we understand quality between products and data. And uh, knowing that hopefully you know, will help. And then how to talk to data people. So explain why. I think that's probably the most important thing that you can do. Uh, to get data practitioners on board is explain why it's important and how it's going to help you. And so that requires patience. So have the patience to explain why you need something. And then spend the time to figure out what to gather. So you know what, what needs to be delivered. And we have some measures or metrics to say what's acceptable. And then leave the how to data practitioners. 
because they don't they don't like to be told how to do things because they have spent a lot of time figuring out lots of different ways of doing things and uh, it's best to leave it to them and make sure to give them a deadline right so data people never stop tinkering so you have to give them a deadline uh, otherwise you will not you're not going to get something so capture data the right way so governance really happens at creation time. So quality at creation time is the easiest to um, enforce and it propagates. Uh, obviously quality changes when uh, a particular data element that's created of good quality uh, travels through its path in life and gets combined with other things and quality might suffer and it has to be, the quality has to be fixed again. But the easiest place to impose quality and governance is at the creation time. And then the importance of metrics and benchmarks. If we can't measure, we can't improve. Measure what is of value. We talked about what's of value, what's not of value. And more importantly, do not measure waste. You know, vanity metrics are useless, you know, number of followers, um, those type of things, number of people that love me, it makes you feel good, but uh, it's not useful, right? So those are essentially vanity metrics that are really um, not necessary. Impact of data quality. So good data makes good things happen, and good data prevents bad things from happening. So these are the um, two things to remember, and th that's the impact that data has on business. Right. Bad data, bad things happen. Uh, so finally, those are the takeaways that I have for you guys. I hope this uh, presentation has been helpful. Now I turn it back to Shannon and uh, Q&A. Kasi, thank you so much for this great presentation. And if you have questions, feel free to submit them in the Q&A section in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. And to find that icon, just click the three dots in the bottom middle of your screen. Uh, so, um, and just to answer the most commonly asked questions, I just a reminder, I will be sending a follow-up email to all registrants by end of day Monday with links to the slides and links to the recording. So jumping right in here, Kasu, uh, how much of the nuts and bolts needs to be explained to non-data people? Um, as little as possible, <laughs> right? So, like I was saying, are you saying how much of the how much business people had to explain to data people? Is that what you're asking? No. Well, how much of the nuts and bolts needs to be explained? Well, to non-data people. So the other way around. Oh, the the yeah. other way around. Um, again, depends on the data person. Typically, I would not explain a lot of the nuts and bolts. So the only time you really need to do that, the nuts and bolts, like, you know, when we go back to that first slide where, you know, there's a board full of equations, most business people don't want that. But there are always what, what we used to call power users that want to know exactly how you do it. So that, those tend to be the exceptions, but most business people are interested in seeing what the end product is. So all the questions that we've got, that can't be. <laughs> <laughs> okay, must have been crystal clear. So we've got more coming in. <laughs> it's an additional comment to that to that question. Just need to justify resources required for data quality. So how do you do that? So, so that it's a, it's hard because if you say somebody is, um, you know, I need a data quality engineer, right? So it's hard to define the job description. You can always say, I need a QA, so from the application side, it's much easier to justify resources. So what we have to do is we have to uh, come up with creative titles. So I had a guy that was in charge of my data quality. I call him the content officer, right? And so I need somebody to curate the content. I need to somebody to make sure that all the data we received, uh, the sources are correct. And so all of a sudden he had a status that is not a QA because nobody wants to talk to QA. So by being creative like that, you can say, I need a content officer as opposed to saying, I need a data quality guy. 
And I know that it's not much, but it's very hard to justify data quality people because people don't look at the data pipeline and uh, and say that I, I can justify an FTE. Um, and so the way that I used to do it is everybody gets a little bit of it. And this is uh, this is really what has to happen is you take away people, you say, you know, you're working for 10 hours on data quality to somebody that already is doing something and then you and then you create need for other resources as opposed to data quality people. Does that make sense? It does. And you know, what about in the case for um, metadata analysts? So metadata is relatively new. So it depends on the organization because most of us already collect metadata. So if you if you really need a metadata person, for example, you're rolling in. Um, uh, Elation or one of the metadata um, tools, then essentially that person's role, you can call him a librarian, for example, a data librarian, sounds better than a, a data analyst because that's what they're doing. They're, you know, they're in charge of curating the data, making sure, you know, along with the storage, storage, right, because they're working with the storage, but they're essentially the ones that are maintaining the metadata repository. So you have to change the job description and say it's data curator. Right? And so things that uh, appeal to the business people. Business people understand curation. They don't understand metadata. Right? So it's on the data practitioner, on us to say, put the job in terms of what the person is actually doing as opposed to some technical jargon that we have. So how do you convince non-data people that the data actually does have value to the stakeholders needing the data? So this is where you're playing the role of the Steve Jobs. You're deciding that they need some data, right? And for that, to do that, you have to have evidence. For you to get the, get the you know, ear of someone that needs a metric, you know that he needs a metric, but he doesn't know it, right? So the thing is, you have to have proof of why they need it. You can show if if that metric is used, are they going to make um, better decisions? How is that going to help them? Uh, and that so this is why. You, so you have to bring proof. You have to create that trust in that whatever it is that you think that they need. Otherwise, it's you thinking what they need, and they haven't seen the need yet. And it's, there's no way you can sell anything to anybody when they don't see the need for it. So how do you move from uh, minimum viable product to most viable product definition of MVP? <laughs> so I haven't heard that one. Uh, and this is, this, you know, as I think about it, this is how we over-engineer um, data products because we are planning for the apocalypse when um, the, uh, you know, the business side is looking to cross the street, right? And so most viable product is first of all, in my mind, is pretty hard to define what that is. Uh, and if it just happens to be in the, the person that knows the data in their mind, it's going to be really difficult to sell those extra things because they cost money to anybody on the business side. It's just I wouldn't even try to do that. All right, Kasi. Well, that does bring us right to the top of the hour. There's other great questions, and thanks so much to our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do. We just love the questions that have come in. Um, but uh, again, we're right at the top of the hour. Just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday with links to the slides and links to the recording to everybody. Kasi, again, thank you so much for this great presentation, such an important and hot topic, of course, um, and uh, really appreciate it. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thanks, everybody, for um, joining us and staying for an hour, um, appreciate it. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye.